except in Celador paled. Seven, save us wine dribbled down his chin. Lord Commander, whites are monstrous, unnatural creatures, abominations before the eyes of gods. You cannot mean to try to talk with them. Can they talk? asked Jon Snow. I think not, but I cannot claim to know. Monsters they may be, but they were men before they died. How much remains? The one I slew was intent on killing Lord Commander Mo Mormont. Plainly it remembered who he was and where to find him. Maester Eamon would have grasped his purchase, John did not doubt. Sam Tarley would have been terrified, but he would have understood as well. My lord father used to tell me that a man must know his enemies. We understood little of the whites and less about the others. We need to learn. That answer did not please them, Septon Celador fingered the crystal that hung about his neck and said, I think this most unwise. Lord Snow, I shall pray to the crone to lift her shining lamp and lead you down the path of wisdom. The Dance with Dragons, John 8. And the amount of irony in this excerpt is off the charts. So hello and welcome back to the Fattest Leech of Ice and Fire. I'm Leech and this is the second of the Corpse Handler trio of books uh, written by George R. R. Martin. The first uh, video that we made a few weeks ago was Override. This one is called Nobody Leaves New Pittsburgh. And this one, and then the next one we're going to do Meat House Man, really introduces George's own personal elements and emotions into the story. So corpse handling, as gross and icky as it sounds, really serves a purpose. So I've started the book club reread for the older works of George R. R. Martin. And if you don't have these books yet, some of the old ones, they are still out there in various places. Uh, this is the, the first edition print of this story, Nobody Leaves New Pittsburgh. And this is what I'm working with that is the text from this particular book. September 19, uh, yeah, September 1976. And then <clears throat> there's very little artwork in this book. Anybody who knows me knows I'm a sucker for the old artwork. Uh, this picture is on my blog page under the reread section for Nobody Leaves New Pittsburgh if you want to see anything closer. And then <clears throat> a quick reminder that there are spoilers all over the place for anything from So Spake Martin to inter other interviews uh, to other George R. R. Martin books, possibly even some books from other authors, depending on what we're talking about. Uh, <clears throat> nothing is too sacred in this discussion uh, because in order to dis fully uh, discuss this series, we have to talk about everything. And there's so much overlap, you cannot dissect the two. <clears throat> so what is this story all about? Well, it's just under 5,000 words. It was published in 1976. And he was writing it around the time that he had some other stories coming out. Um, but I want to caution that um, even though there are a handful of stories that were published around the same time, that doesn't mean they were all written around the same time. So um, this story was written around the same time as um, Override and Meat House Man and um, the spring of 1971. Uh, he also had some other stories that he was writing at the time, such as Dark Dark Were the Tunnels, which is another really great short story. It's a little sad. This one's sad. I don't know if I can get around to <laughs> reviewing that one anytime soon. And then Night Shift. The story Night Shift has some elements that... Um, play into this particular story well, as well as just the corpse handling in general. Um, <clears throat> things that come from real life for George. So <clears throat> this story 
is a one of the ones this one is especially doubly triply meat house man is like um a section out of george's personal diary and we'll go over that in a little bit so um I, as i said in the previous override video it's we readers might have to um, disassociate ourselves with what we personally in our own lives think of as really gross and icky or in Song of Ice and Fire terms as abominations. It's not about what we readers think. It's about author intent. I know, and I know that phrase, using that phrase <clears throat> to anybody in the literary world, that can be cringy enough. Um, the whole concept of author intent is very heavy in George's books. Um, he personally mentions all of these direct details from his own life, his own people, his own experiences that are influencing him that he's writing into a story. <clears throat> so um, this story, Nobody Leaves New Pittsburgh, uh, it's possibly that it's part of the Thousand Worlds universe. It would be like a subset trio of stories. There's, it has some uh, common uh, common elements uh, that it shares with the Thousand Worlds universe, such as the different metals, maybe some descriptions of planets, things like that. But I don't think it's ever truly, truly been confirmed by George himself that it's part of Thousand Worlds. But that's okay, because that just goes to show <laughs> that George's own writing style and themes trans transfers across literally all of his work even it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be a, a particular universe with its own rules it's martin world that has martin's rules so um the main character glenn sykes uh conveys and a, a large amount of anger at the people who accept their life on this planet and they don't try to escape like he does much like Ed Cochran in the story Override. Um, Ed Cochran in Override, he tries to dupe his friends, um, th his friend, um, Matt Cabaragian, who's the main protagonist of that story. Um, so he could, so, so Ed can leave. So Ed's trying to pull like a blood betrayal in, in that story, where in this one, Sykes is a little pungent in a different way. Um, it's more a, family lineage issue for him, um, as well as, again, the, the very common theme in George's work that there's this overbearing, overreaching dragon element of either corporate control or governmental control, and they often go claw and claw. And that's essentially what the dragons and ice and fire are a metaphor for. Um, and it has to, both of them have to do with money, control, and war. Um, the driving force behind um, Glenn Sykes' bitter tongue in this story, I would say, is the legacy of his father that he left behind. The, the, the question that we're left with is, will Glenn ever ex escape New Pittsburgh? So... The exploitative system that's in this story here, that's in the that's in the Corpse Handler trilogy in general, that we also see growing and developing in Ice and Fire, um, is the message. Message seems to be about the nature of corp corporations, the government working the laborer to death and beyond. Meat House Man shows this idea in the strongest way, as does Override. Um, Bartling storms into the picture in Override, and that's like, you know, like the dragon flying in on page. Um, even though Armageddon Rag isn't part of the Thousand Worlds universe, it, is, it, it also shows these dragons very clearly uh, between the fever dreams that Sandy Blair has and how that compares to what he experiences in his real life. And so it's um, it's a little bit prophetic without calling it actual prophecy. Uh, <clears throat> so a corpse handler, what is a corpse handler? 
That sounds really gross, right? Well, is a living human that controls the select dead by way of implants and remote control. There's no murder here. Nobody's killing anybody to get um, a corpse to do their bidding. Most of the time. There's an exception in this story here that we will see <clears throat> and we'll talk about. Um, this is akin to the dragon elements, the extreme dragon elements and mind control. <laughs> Think back to how Martin details how his intent for Danny in his 93 outline is she was going to have psionic mind control powers, which allowed mind control over people such as the Dothraki. And she was, the Targaryens in general weren't going to have actual dragons. There was just going to be their sigil. But so instead, the fire element from the Targaryens was going to be pyrokinesis. <clears throat> so a lot of Psylink powers. And um, this is also from the other side, the other dragon, the ice dragon others. This is the whiting process that the others perform in their war efforts to take over the rule of Westeros. That's essentially what the whites want. The whites have burst onto page literally before anything else in the story. They're looking most likely long running theory that I <clears throat> have had and was discussed on the Westeros.org forum for a while was or is that the whites are looking for either Jon Snow in particular or a Lord Commander. And as we go back up to that original uh, chapter excerpt that I was reading, John says, and they're plainly it remembered. So something is remembering, but something and other is working through the white because whatever the corpse handler is, whoever the corpse handler is, remembers. They're looking either for Jon Snow or for whoever is the current uh, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. That's a little bit of a different topic. Um, <clears throat> and then, oh, and some of the other George stories, like Thousand Worlds Universe Proper, is um, an, another way that George rewrites this purpose is um, in this um, archetype of the Harangans. The Harangans are essentially either one of the two dragon elements, either the Targaryen fire dragon elements or the ice dragon others. And um, in Thousand Worlds, just briefly in Thousand Worlds universe, um, the Harangans were humanity's greatest enemy and they started with the double, known as the double war, which is the Dance of Dragons in A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, George said in his outline that there was going to be another dance coming up that's going to be d dragon against dragon, however that works out. Most likely with Danny with the others first, and then Danny with probably Aegon the Six, and then Danny with John. Um, <clears throat> but the Harangans were bitterly xenophobic. Um, prior to the double war, they enslaved a dozen less advanced races and there is evidence that they had exterminated a ton of other races entirely. Uh, the war effectively destroyed the Harangans except on Old Haranga. Her old Haranga is essentially like Old Valyria. And uh, so the war effectively destroyed the Harangans except on Old Haranga itself and a handful of other colonies. So that's like the Valyrian sister cities like Lys, you know, things like that. Um, but they did use a type of coercive mind control. That's what the word, a uh, bit of the etymology of the word harangan comes from harangue. Um, and the slave race that they use most often was, were ones called the Haroon. And in the prologue for Tough Voyaging um, that starts that entire series, that starts with, um, oh, I just did the, <laughs> I just did the video. It's give me a second. The prologue to the, the plague start. That's when we get um, a pretty good firsthand example of 
a very clear result of the double war with the Harangans. What the results of that were ecological disaster. That is a very common theme in the Corpse Handler series. Um, that's a very common theme in the entire Tough Voyaging series. And that is, George didn't really, there's an interview out there where he likens the incoming disasters of the others as being, or the dragons, uh, as being close to an environmental disaster, but he's not using an exact real world analog one-to-one. -one. It's something, ecological disasters is, are something that he's been writing about since the late 60s or 70s. So it's, it's, it's in his Martin World collection. Um, so if I were to draw a slightly more direct link to A Song of Ice and Fire, um, between what these, what these corpse handlers and what these, these dra extreme dragons are, um, is the corporate productive system is the ice dragon others and the overreaching government, the suppressing government is the red, are the red fire dragons, um. And of course, there are rare minor exceptions, but I'm talking about like, especially what George describes or explains is like the main canon of the books, which is the main, um, you know, the main five, six, seven books, however many we're going to get. So to be whited is to be taken as a slave. The unsullies, unsullied are taken as warrior army men. I know there's, in the books that the careful reader will see, especially somebody that knows how George writes and handles slavery, what Danny did there as a dragon queen is she performed basically a religious miracle. She came as the, um, whatever the, the unsullied goddesses, the, um, li uh, the lady of the shield or it's their battle goddess so she didn't really collect this and free this undead coll collection of humans she took them into her service they are now her warriors um undead gregor clegane is another uh, example that we're going to see gregor was not in and what happened to him between he and Kyburn was not something George just made up for a song of ice and fire. Um, a lot of people who are essentially lick spittles in a song of ice and fire, they are like the Haroon race that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. They, even if they're alive, they've been mentally enslaved by this mind controller overlord on whether it's like ABC or whatever tier in the story. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the idea of just following orders is, is, is not good. You're being mind controlled, manipulated one way or the other when you're just following orders. And I think in my, in my opinion, and I know the opinion of others that that is something George is trying to make very obvious in the story that if you were somebody who just follows orders, you're really not one of the good guys. Um, you're going to work yourself to death for the benefit of somebody else. Um, so <clears throat> what's in a name? The next section I talk about on my blog page. So if you want to follow along, if you want to read the story, if you don't have it already, um, and you are able to find your print copy and you want to participate in the reread. I have all of the text and all of these notes, plus so, so many more on my blog page, fattestleechoficeandfire.com under the reread tab. At this point, I think I have 26 or 27 stories that are um, transcribed and noted for the, for the reread. Okay, so what's in a name? Um, there's a couple of interviews, many uh, out there all around the place where George essentially says the same thing over and over again. Here is a direct quote, one of his. He says, ultimately it comes down to what sounds right. And I struggle with that. 
finding the right name for a character. If I can't find the right name, I don't know who the character is and I can't proceed. So each of these rereads, one of the first things that I do is try to decode the names of the characters and why. Most of the time it works out and I find some really cool new information. Sometimes it's just a, a, an interesting name and I haven't found a real reason or a real consistency between his work yet. So let's start with the main character, Glenn Sykes. <clears throat> he's the main POV and he's basically a Martin styled green man. And um, Glenn is, the meaning of Glenn is for somebody who lived in valleys. It's or a habitational name from a place with such a word as Glen near Sykes. So Glen is a green place, um, both in name and also in location. Sykes is a topographic name for someone who lived by a stream in particular, in a marsh or in a hollow. Uh, it comes from the Middle English, meaning marshy stream or damp gully. Think Cranigman. So yeah, he's he, Glenn Sykes. <clears throat> you'll see that he has elements of Bran and elements of John, who are both the part of the Green Men system in A Song of Ice and Fire. And then, and then we get to Banner. Banner is a man who in is a character in this story that's remembered in a flashback. The flashback is very important, um, gives us a lot of information on the orientation between the, the Dragon Element Company and the regular small, small folk. Um, Banner is a name for a person who was the standard bearer for a king, since Banner is working for the company. Um, or the king in Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, he is essentially a standard bearer for an icy fire dragon king. Um, Melisandre is uh, with <clears throat> with her her ability in dark arts and shadow binding. Um, she rides in with Stannis when we first meet her with Catelyn out in the fields. And um, I always thought it was kind of bizarre that Melisandre was carrying the standard, but it makes absolute complete sense when you read more of Martin World, like this story here, <clears throat> and you understand why. Um, also, Banner in this story, uh, he's, um, he's also a Kyburn prototype not only for creating fun and profit, but also blurring the lines between torture and possible real scientific advancement. So that's the thing. That's like magic in general in A Song of Ice and Fire. And I'll, I'll do a video about this pretty soon, hopefully sooner than later. But the, the structure of what is essentially magic or knowledge, greater knowledge, whatever you want to call it, it's not secret sci-fi. Um, is base the, the tree the green tree is the norm is the standard that's what Westeros is going to return to after the rise of the ice dragon others and the rise of the fire dragon Targaryens Danny those are the two extremes so they overlap so they share some um, talents and abilities with the green but those two extremes are like the broken off brothers the, the blood betrayal the brother against brother sibling against sibling um, so <clears throat> he's also blurring that's what I'm saying he's also blurring the lines between real scientific advancement and torture because if this was a green man that's doing this stuff it's like we're gonna see brand do Bran and Sam combo do in A Song of Ice and Fire, the knowledge that they gain is going to be for the advancement of the people. If Bran has to very gruesomely skin change Hodor, that is because that serves a bigger purpose, which is serving the many. Protecting literally 
the realms of men. Realms has a double meaning. It's not just the Westerlands, the Riverlands, Dorne. It's not just those geographic locations, but it's also the astral plane. You know, the, the different the different levels of, of consciousness, the different realms. And that has to do with doorways and a couple of other things. We're going to get to that in a different video. But that's not what Banner is doing. That's not what we see these extreme dragon elements doing in these corpse handling uh, stories. They're not doing anything for any sort of advancement. They're doing something for profit and they're doing something for war, which usually one is feeding the other. Kind of like in real life, you know? Um, <clears throat> and remember, in Ice and Fire, Kyburn did lose his maester's chain because of practicing necromancy. Okay, then we get to Karpov. Um, it is said that this name Karpov is said to originate from the Greek word karpos, meaning fruit. It was originally used as a personal name of endearment, but has since been changed. So think of Doran Martell and his overripe fruit plan uh, that he's trying to set off down in Dorn, where he has sent both of his children. He's, he's kind of like the inverse polar opposite, if you will, of um, Howland Reed, you know, um, both of them sent their kids off, but one of them sent their kid off to the green element to, <clears throat> um, for the, for the betterment, betterment of all of Westeros, one of them, Doran, sent his two kids off to another dragon element, but that was for personal gain. That was for House Martell, for Arian, for whoever, that was for personal gain. That was not for the betterment of Westeros. <clears throat> So this over-ripened fruit metaphor started back with Karpov. And I do believe that Quentin is dead. He has to be dead for literary reasons to, in short, is to progress the arcs of a, a few other people that are, at this point, much more important than Quentin. I have an essay on that. It's on this blog, but it also has its own page. So if you're interested, um, you, that's where you can find it. Um, <clears throat> Karpov is also the Robert Strong prototype. And we'll get to that a little bit later. So uh, yeah, with Kyburn and the question about the head that's on Robert Strong right now. Yeah, though, I mean, that's that's a very literal outward metaphor for playing mind games, <laughs> for being a corpse, corpse handler, corpse controller. And then we have a, a, a couple of other random people. There's the small man or the depot man. Um, he's called both. He's an employer that runs, runs the storage shed. This is an element that's very close to some details in the stone city, which I have transcribed on my blog. If you want to take a look at that, um, but this small man or this depot man uh, falls into the category of the small folk. Like we see with a few others in the in this story where they had to, they were all basically downgraded. They had to start answering to this, um, this dragon Targaryen force called the company. And they had to start serving them. Um, so they lost a lot of their own individuality and own source of income um, but again that's that's all written out in the story and, and you'll see why so yeah what I'm really trying to get you to do do here is like encourage you to read the story and then come back and find me somewhere um, me and a couple of other nerdy people and we can talk about this story in depth uh, then there's Rob Kenyon he's a barkeep Rob is a name that's often used across Martin world. Um, Kenyon as a boy's name um, is Irish in origin and it means blonde. So we have this little blonde person and um, then we have Mueller. Mueller has a very small role in this story, but it's great. And immense and I mean that in the, the more true definition it's a it's a great role um, he's very much like 
Tormund to Jon Snow. Um, and uh, Mueller is a German word that means Miller as a profession. <clears throat> so what does George have to say on the matter? Like, what are his opinions about this story? Well, I have several Dream Songs excerpts on here. I'm not going to read them all because that's for you to do if you were interested, but it's all right there on the blog page. Something I want to point out in, in, in particular, when George is talking about Night Shift, when he's talking about this story um, and the other corpse handler stories, um, something he notes is Night Shift Oh, let me start at the beginning. He says, of course, it was true that I had based night shift on my father's experience as a longshoreman and a few weeks I once spent working in a truck dispatch office. So we have a lot of this repe repeating theme of son following in the father's footsteps uh, that is literally based on George's own personal experience in life. He, for a while, when he was a young lad, he was following his brother, or sorry, his father's footsteps because Bayonne was keeping him trapped for a long time. Uh, when you dream, read Dream Songs and other George uh, interviews, you'll, you, he even goes on about he went to college. You know, he got out of Bayonne. He was so excited. He went to college, moved halfway across the U.S., started experiencing new things, and then he got sucked back. <laughs> he had to move back home. That's important to this story. Um, and then there's a really good one. There we go. And then he starts to go on. Then he starts to go on with another quote. Um, he says, seven stories in all. Maybe it was the specter of Vietnam that had goaded me or my accumulated frustration at having neither a job, a girl, nor a life. Nobody leaves New Pittsburgh, though. Perhaps the weakest of the, uh, the story that I produced that summer, spring of 1971, reflects my state of mind most clearly. For New Pittsburgh, read Bayonne. For Corpse, read me. That's, yeah, that's... Um, <laughs> the only time he gets has uses stronger words or more emotion with corpse handling is in the story uh, Meat House Man. We'll get to that next time. I can't wait. That's my most favorite George story ever, but it's it's emotionally very sad. <clears throat> Which brings us to um, the sections in the story. I, on my blog page, you'll see that at the, at the top, I have um, a link to each of the five sections. It's a short story, but I still broke it down to hopefully make it easier for rereads. If you, if you can only do like a, a section at a time, you can jump to uh, where you had left off. The sections, that, the, the sections that I <laughs> broke this down into are the rainy beginning, uh, what is corpse handling, which this story gives a really good, like textbook definition of what's going on. Uh, cause this is good to know, especially when we get to meat house, man, because it can be a little confusing, uh, to try to understand what's really happening there. If you don't know the, the basics of the, the operations, this story explains it right out and then the tree man remembers that's the third section death walks into a bar that's where most of our action happens and then Balar Morgolis that is our conclusion and um, that's where George leaves us with a couple of deep thoughts and some might even say a an open ending um, but I think he gives us enough direction of what is possible in this story or after this story for this character, especially again, knowing George that this is based a lot on George's life being stuck in Bayonne and then finally breaking free. There's a few associations that if you wanted a, con a more concrete conclusion, there you go, have at it. 
so the rainy beginning. Um, the four who walked breathe. Uh, the four who walked breathe. Okay, so four of them waiting in the drizzling rain of New Pittsburgh. Four who walked and breathed, but only one lived. So we're put in this situation right away, practically in um, Sykes's mind uh, as he's controlling these other dead men. He just gets back to New Pittsburgh and uh, a big, what the, what the uh, corpses are used for, uh, it doesn't really say in this story. Uh, there's a variety of jobs that the corpses perform. It's basically a job that is considered to be subhuman. Um, in, in Night Flyers and in um, Sand Kings, which are two what I call non-official corpse handling stories, corpse handling happens. Again, that's where we get back to uh, a great other type, a dragon, very specifically a dragon type that uses mind control to control the corpses for war. So we can add that into the list. Um, so we get there and we'll, again, like I was saying earlier, we're introduced to this ecological disaster of a planet. And we learn through these stories that it has happened on, on each of these, um, except for Except for not as much in Grotto, but it's happened on each of these um, planets where they use not just corpses, but lots of very industrial machines. And it, it just literally like just breaks down the earth. Uh, remember, George is an old hippie. So that is uh, important to keep in mind when we're reading about... Um, this stuff happening in stories and, and we're asking ourselves why why is George putting this in a story this can't be just random um, so all the corpse handling stories take place in, um, on, on on planets that are like Valyria or what happened in the doom of Valyria especially what happened in the what I call the doom of hard home <laughs> those are ice and fire dragon events those have to do with um, over mining and overmining and other ecological disasters that um, killed lots of people. Um, other, so Valyria, going back to like wordplay here, is most likely where um, is is derived from George's word for Vendalia. That's one of the planets is Vendalia. So we hear a little bit about it in this story. Sykes is just coming from Vandalia back to New Pittsburgh. Vandalia is seen, we actually go there and meet House Man. Um, Scracky is another one. Gideon and Grotto. Grotto is what we saw in Override. And I just want to, the name Gideon, like we were, you know, talking about a few minutes ago, names mean something. Uh, it's a masculine name. And it means great warrior. And when we get to meet House Man, <laughs> that's going to be very important because that, that's where the warrior um, fighting pits are. And again, this is a connection back to Daenerys reopening the fighting pits in Marine. She's getting back to her Valyrian roots with everything she does. Um, and she, I mean, she calls it out in the beginning, in the first book where she says she's the blood of Magor the Cruel. Cool cruel and a daughter of old Valyria. I forget what the exact quote is. Um, and Vend Vendalia, the real word origin for that um, comes from what is called the Grand Ohio Company. And here it's just called the company. Um, and it was planned as a new colony and it was initially called Pittsylvania. So that's where we get new Pittsburgh from with Vendalia and all this other stuff and stuff. It's, it's all connected and I have all of the notes. Um, and it's even related to Vendalic tribesmen, which is, you know, like Targaryen. So, um, so he gets back and everything's, he's noticed everything's like falling apart. Like 
where has the income and the, the money and the progress gone to um, on this planet? You know, he was born there, he grew up there, he left there a few years ago, and he comes back and everything's deteriorated. And um, so he's walking his dead men in to store them. And even there, even in the shed, well, what they call the shed, the, the dead man depot, um, they used to be stored on shelves. Dead men used to be, you know, at the end of the day, you walk your dead men in and they are stored on shelves. They're, they're kept clean. You know, we see a lot of this in the story override as well. But, you know, they're kept clean and um, even though they're dead, they're taken care of. So there's a little bit of um, House of Black and White in there. And um, in the morning, you go back and you, you get your, your crew and then you go back to work. Here, they don't even have shovels anymore. Everything is just lumped. They're all just lumped together. And Sykes is throwing a fit. He's like, I'm not doing this. These guys are expensive. Literally, these guys, <laughs> these guys, they're expensive. And they're going to get trampled and they're going to get destroyed. He has no choice, though. Um, and then he goes on and he he's walking around and he's noticing that even all of the color has drained out of this area. Um, it's a monotony that matches the flat gray sky. And then um, he thinks back and he's like, the only color that he remembers seeing is the color of blood. So there's a lot of fire and blood elements that are going on at this point part in the story um but then we start then we start to get the information of how the company has moved in and has really degraded everything seems like they're you know the company's doing well <laughs> nobody else is doing well the company is doing well um so there's this one section that i want to read here so they had no names the course the corpses not anymore they had forfeited their names with their lives. Then they committed their crimes or had their accidents. Death had come on dingy, on dingy corpse yard operating tables where their brains, crippled criminal troublemaking, were ripped out and destroyed. Then they rose again with corpse pseudo minds and their skulls to command the skilled living bodies. The newborn dead. So Think back to George's terms like the never born, <laughs> things like that. So here we have the newborn dead, uh, born with the dead, um, the newborn dead, the cheapest labor of them all. As men, they built up a debt to the society. They paid it off with their lives and their bodies. You didn't waste anything in this universe and the bodies of the condemned criminals made valuable machines. So that's like the Unsullied. That's like Regal. Viserion and Drogon. They have, uh, they're essentially, Danny mentions very clearly that they are dead stone. Dragons haven't been around in a few centuries at this point, and ice and fire. And um, there's a point in the first book where Jorah asks Danny, he says, Can you raise the dead girl? And then she does. She raises the dead. She, her children, Regal, Viserion, and Drogon, using the spirits or the minds even of past dead Targaryens, uh, people in her family. Also the Night's Watch, uh, which has forgotten its true purpose. And chances are the vows as we know them are altered history. And um, chances are the others are probably going to corpse handle the dead within the, the lickyard at Castle Black or even uh, at Winterfell, you know, Wherever they go, the Barrowlands, who, who knows what's going to happen there. The thing is, is all of that is within George's bag of tricks. That's all within his Martin world possibilities. There's a few characters, there's a character that's like Donald Noy. Um, and then there's this one part, and I asked the same question in Override. Um, so one of Sykes's men, remember he's a green guy, Whenever one of Sykes's um, men um, was, he says the second was something else, a seven foot giant, a muscle man with broad shoulders and thick corded arms. Sykes had saved 
for two years to buy him, but it was worth it. He was a prize, a first class corpse, top meat. So this is the question that I also asked in Override, is who built the wall? That's, we're not going to answer that right now, but that's something to question and something to keep in mind for further conversation. Because in George's world, it's not the corpse handling that's an abomination, but rather it's the mind control use of the living. So uh, there's a chance that the wall was built with corpses, possibly, but Again, I, and I cannot stress this enough. It's also shown in Override. It's not the use of dead people. That's the abomination. It's the use of living people and invading them while they're living. Veramir is a very clear example of this. He is um, an extreme ice dragon other um, symbol in the story. And what happens when those archetypes get a hold and, and misuse a green magic. So then we go on and he's talking with um, the small man, the depot man. And then there's this one line in here that's really tricky. It says, Sykes didn't like the man. He stifled the urge uh, to ask what happened to Banner and the old depot clerk. That's pretty high, he said, toying. What if I don't want to convert? He's talking about money at this point. Go to, or got to, the, mo <laughs> the small man snapped. The company rules. The company rules, you get it? You like that pun? Yes, of course the company rules. The Targaryens rule, but, that's, but they're all invaders. This is not their place. Um, And then he goes on to opening gates. This is something I sort of remarked a little bit in the, in the beginning when I talked about um, Bran possi possibly having Bran and the Hodor hold the gate moment. Um, holding a gate, holding a door, holding a passageway is very dangerous, perilous work in Martin world st starting all the way back with his story only kids are afraid of the dark which I do have transcribed this is something a theme that he has been carrying and reusing since the 60s he even has a television show called doorways that's all about this dragon hunter guy that is chasing this young girl across many different realms get it the realms of men across many different realms to hunt her. <laughs> so we open a gate here too. That's when the company comes in. That's when the dragon comes through. Then we get to section two. And um, so he's, he's going through. It's, it's very much like a maze that he's going through. It's a bit like Danny in the House of the Undying. It's a bit like Bran when he first gets north of the, the wall in his first chapter in A Dance of Dragons. And um, he, they're all walking around and it's like a maze and they have to navigate across, you know, around, a an icy lake, things like that. So it's the same mix of, the same mix of ingredients are in all of these situations. So then we get to section three where he sort of has this, that's when he has this flashback, uh, a fever dream, if you will. Um, he 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 thumbed the belt box off and returned to the reception room the small man was putting on his gloves behind him the second door was open sykes got a glance of the body face down on a white table with a shining new metal plate in his skull i'm not going to read i want you to read this section this is in the second paragraph in section three uh this is where we really start to see that it's one, this is one of the places where we really start to see that it's not the corpse handling in general that is the abomination. It is the doing this stuff to the living. Oh, um, yeah, stealing bodies for any sort of whiting purpose, whatever you want to call it. This is also something that's done in his story, The Needleman, Needlemen and The Glass Flower, and including like the Dragon Mothership in her crystal matrix mind and night flyers. 
I have all of those stories transcribed and links to them in this story. So if you're just reading through and want to see what I'm talking about, I have it there. Um, and then there's this quote from A Dance of Dragons with Bran. It says, the moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as a blade of a knife. Summer dug up a severed arm, black and covered with hoarfrost, its fingers opening and closing as it pulled itself across the frozen snow. There was still enough meat on it to fill his empty belly, and after that was done, he cracked the arm bones for the marrow. Only then did the arm remember that it was dead. That is not a random line. So it kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of this. Um, the others are looking for the right person. They probably, it's, it's plausible, I think it's plausible that they have their own prophecy um, or they have their own version of history repeating with the twist. They're looking for either the Stark and Winterfell, Jon Snow, the King of Winter, whoever the new uh, Lord Commander is, uh, but also probably the next Green Seer. I'm very convinced that they're also looking for the next Green Seer because that's the only person that can override their override box. Notes from the story override. <laughs> if you ever read that story, uh, it'll it'll make sense then. But that's the only person that can really, truly stop them on their different realms. Their realm in the astral plane, as well as the realm of men, is this green, is the next green seer, which is um, whoever is the highest ranking level of the Night's Watch. I know we think it's Lord Commander, but it's not really Lord Commander. It's the green seer. It's the watcher. He is the ultimate watcher. And that's what the, that's what the trees are for. So but that's a, that's a theory for in a discussion for another video. So we get this, this whole section goes into depth about what a corpse handler actually is. And even though George says he doesn't really like the story, it's, he, or he doesn't find that it's one of his strongest. I com totally appreciate the information that he gives us in this story. So, gay for him. Thank you. We're keeping it. I don't care if you don't like it, George. Sorry. Um, and then we get some information that gives us example uh, prototypes of, of Craster. Um, and then, again, ideas that he, he brought back for... Um, the sworn sword, we, where we see all of these conditions are worsening. Crester and, and um, the situation in the, the sworn sword, and even in the world of ice and fire, where there's the whole discussion about Targaryen incest, um, over and over and over again, not even in just the world of ice and fire, but uh, how the Targaryen incest is or anybody who practices incest in the story including uh tywin lannister and um arianne martell when when she sort sort of fascinates about it um or fantasizes about it and that all brings down a downfall of a dynasty that's how you bring down the company that's or that is what brings it down that is a downfall of a dynasty that's a decaying that's something going into ruin but that's a even though it's a long-term process not a short story so then death walks into a bar there's a lot of things in here that george reused for his story a night at the tarn house which is not actually a story that's in, set in his universe it's for a jack vance collection but I have the link to Night at Tarn House because I did transcribe that. Um, so jo or Sykes runs into some of his old friends. This is where he really sees firsthand how this is how this whole company issue moving in and trying to establish the rule over people long term has degraded everything. That's what we're seeing in A Song of Ice and Fire. It's a long game George is playing here. The others have been building for a long time, probably 
similar in, in, in time to the Targaryens, three, four hundred years, because there's an interview out there where George says, straight up, that's what the title of the series is. It's a war story. And um, the two dragon elements <laughs> are the biggest threats. So um, we just, as readers, get to experience the growth of these villains not just them walking on stage and being like ta-da we're, we're we're baddies we get the we get the example with the others and then we're gonna get that with Daenerys and there's a couple of funny little lines in here where people say I never expected to come back it's kind of like um Alistair Thorne um and when he when John sends him sends them out ranging <laughs> and Alistair's like yeah I'll, I'll be back so what is he going to come back as <laughs> um, yeah more information that's like the Doom of Valeria or the Doom of Hardhoom um, there's information in here that speaks to Arian Targaryen as a because he's a company officer so more Dunkin' Egg information and um there was a recent video, and I will link to it, where Elio or Rand was telling um, readers that we all should be paying more attention to Aryan Targaryen. And uh, there's a, yeah, there's a reason why for that, but I'll, I'll link to the video below. Um, yeah, but then. Again, remember, New Pittsburgh is George's Bayonne, and he's, Sykes is going into it right now over and over again that you don't have to remind me I was born here. I know this. I know this. Just like only one man in a thousand is born a skin changer. And then we get to another part where we learn that Sykes's father didn't want Sykes to become a, a corpse handler, handler like he was, so he kept him away from that. And that is the role of the maesters in the books, um, or one of their roles, um, is to, is the suppression of, in denial and suppression of any green magic. Children of the forest, any green magic such as warging or skin changing or green dreams, nah, that stuff is, that stuff doesn't doesn't matter yeah right um yeah without without a warg having a wolf to open his mind a warg will never understand what he is it's a it's a it's reflected from this story into a song of ice and fire so that's a long running theory that i've had is the reason why and shortly, in, in short, the reason why um, the kids get the pups in the snow, which was George's first visions of A Song of Ice and Fire, is he needed he needed something, you know, born with the dead. These the pups were born with the dead. Uh, George needed to get this familiar other with the Stark kids uh, right away, so they can grow together, so they can represent each other in character and emotion and name is because that was the key to unlock them. Maester Lewin, bless his heart as much as we love him, he didn't he was just just following orders with the Maesters and suppressing the screen magic. It's not until Maester Aemon died and he went to the tree that he realized that he was wrong. That this green magic shit is real. <laughs> So the opposite parallel to that is written in here where we have um, the rent and the depot and the fees and the imported food. Nothing can grow here on this muck hole. That phrase there goes uh, hand in hand with dragons plant no trees, ironborn do not sow, the Dothraki do not grow or sow or plant. They don't they don't do any, they don't provide for themselves in any way. Um, all of them pillage from everybody else to get, what they, to get what they have. Everybody else's work 
all those those little workers do the job and then the dragons plant no trees the you know the dragons come in and they take it the dothraki come in and they take it the ironborn do not sow they come in and they take it it's the iron pan the iron price um i have an essay called sewing red dragons that has to do with this and how all of these the elements are going to come together that's been the plan all along and they're going to come to sewing and sewing s-e-w-i-n-g it's play on words with creating a new banner because Danny thinks about creating a new banner for herself. Uh, also, Crestor's Keep and King's Landing, those are both referred to as midden heaps. Those are, those are the, more of those dragon incest places, the places where dragons go and if they, whatever s version of seeds they have for war, that's where their seeds <laughs> come from. Whether it's Craster's kids through the incest or the Targaryens and King's Landing and Dragonstone through the incest. Those, yeah, that's, all of those little weird turns of phrases have been in the works for a long time. <laughs> and I think it's awesome. I think it's fun. When you, cut, when you read Martin World stuff and then you go into Song of Ice and Fire, which is part of Martin World, you're, it just, it, it's very exciting because you know what's going to happen or most likely what's going to happen, what this means. <laughs> uh, so we have more Doom of, Valer Doom of Valyria. And then Valar Morgulis and Valar Doharis. Doharis. All men must die and all men must serve. That is corpse handling under a fancy accent. <laughs> and again, all of that information is here. And I am really just trying to encourage you to read this story to get involved in Martin World so you can come nerd out with me and some other friends. Uh, more information about Hard Home. Um, and even some references to the Arm of Dorn are in here. And then, um, so, you know, he's hanging out, Sykes is hanging out with his friends and they're talking about, you know, given their stories of how da downtrodden they are since this company came in and, and what's going on and who's been married and who's died. And um, then we get to this, this point towards the end of this section where Sykes is doing a little bit more um, looking into himself, like self-reflection is going on. And he says, crude, that was the word for corpse labor. And to, many's, to many for corpse handlers. That was why Sykes would not be welcomed on Mountainholm. That was why he, they'd whisper meat mind and ghoul behind his back. But he still wanted to go. So, um, yeah, again, Sykes is a, is a very desperate, like, green person in Martin world. Um, one of many. There's one in... Like almost just about every one, most of his stories, 99% of his stories. Um, but that also, we see how George uh, repurposed that phrase or that, that section, that paragraph into a, um, a Clash of Kings, uh, Bran 5. It says, Bran looked at him, his eyes wide. What? Warg, shapeshifter beastling that's what they'll call you if you should if they should ever hear of your wolf dreams the names made him afraid again who will call me and then Jojen goes on and explains that you know um these so-called high society people which again times history has been lost the meaning in the song of ice and fire the meaning true meaning in in history has been lost. Um, yeah, and Corrin is one of the, Corrin Halfhand is one of the first people in Ice and Fire that sort of breaks that fifth wall for readers when he says, go back and tell them, go back and tell the Night's Watch that the old ways are returning, the trees have eyes again. So that was clue to readers that, oh, okay, we should be paying attention to, to what is popping back up here. 
And so they go on, they talk more about money, um, and then how to travel, how to get money for traveling. And then um, Mueller arrives. So, hi Mueller, he said laughing. You haven't changed a bit. That's a lot like the, the scene where Tormund and John meet back up again at the end of um, a storm of, I think it's a storm of swords after John got back to Castle Black and Mance was there on the other side and Tormund goes up and gives him that great big bear hug. He's like, oh, I'm so good, to, happy to see you. And, you know, your cloak has changed, but you're still John. Uh, it was, it's that type of situation. It's kind of nice. So then we get to section five. This is the closing. It's not very, it's not a very long section, but, um, yeah, they drank until closing him and Mueller and the Andersons who came in later and others, friends and enemies and people that Sykes had long ago forgotten. Uh, this is a bit like John when he is looking out at the free folk and he's like, these are just people. This is a, a collection of people. And then he goes on and, um, he integrates and he learns from them. That's his whole, the whole point of his uh, experience with the free folk is learning from them firsthand. John, as much as people, he is polarizing to, to readers. Everything he does is about learning, 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 not doing things to gain the rule over Westeros, not doing anything to serve himself. He is serving the realms of men. He's the one that is going to be the shield and the legs and the sword and the whatever on the human level element. That's why Bran needs him for his legs. <laughs> um, and then, um, so heavier spoiler at this point, but like I said, when we started, there's spoilers all over. So Sykes leaves the party and he goes to the graveyard. So, John going to go into the crypts and is he going to see anything about either his mother or his father down in the crypts? I don't know. That's kind of a repeating theme in Martin world. So here Sykes found the right marker, a pitted slab graven with the name Donald Sykes. He cursed the plastoid tombstone and the company and new Pittsburgh. And he stood there silent in his cape while the rain fell around him and bit at his bare skin, and he wondered briefly how they told his, his this man grave from the ones they dug for the corpses. Then he realized they don't. So again, Valor Morgulis, all men must die. Valar Doharis, all men must serve. That is uh, corpse handling dialogue. And then there's a little bit more and then you're left to your imagination with certain parts of it. So again, my intent with these videos and my intent with transcribing the stories and, and providing notes along the way is to try to encourage everybody to read these old stories of George um, because Ice and Fire is set in Martin world. Uh, it's not part of any other secret universe inside of George's writing universe. It's its own world, its own society, its own everything. Uh, but this is, these are the origins of it. So it's, Ice and Fire is like a, is like a patchwork of all of George's writing stories, which I have all of George's wherever they are. All of George's stories up there, I have read them over and over again. He has at least 80, I forget the exact count, it's at least 80 stories. And I can tell you over and over again that themes and archetypes and names, um, writing styles, plot styles, a lot of this is repeated. And he says this, this is not me making this up. He, he says this, it's on the front <clears throat> page of my blog. All of the quotes where George says that he reserves the right to reuse his work, and he does. So until we get the winds of winter, until we get a dream of spring, this is what we have to study from in the meantime. And these are great stories. None of there's very few that I that I 
don't like, but there are an awful lot of them that I, that just really get my blood up, like excited to talk about. And this is corpse handling is one of them. I, I can't promise that I can control myself when I get to meet house man. Cause that's one of his best stories ever. Thanks to Harlan Ellison. But, um, if you want to read this story, it's on my blog, fattestleechoficeandfire.com, under the reread tab. Uh, like I said, I have about uh, 26-ish stories transcribed. And um, I'm, we can talk about any one of them at any time. So if you've made it this long, I hope I've encouraged you to read this story and some others. If you've made it this long <laughs> into this recording, Thank you for, for, for your, the jambles and jumbles of the, and, and joining in with Martin World. I appreciate you being here and I will see you next time. And next time it is going to be Meat House Man.